Hello, my name is Martin Nielsen, and I'm a horse parasitologist here at the University of Kentucky. And this is my laboratory. Uh, I sit here today because I wanted to talk to you about what parasites a horse will likely encounter through its life. So I put together this series of videos and basically starting with foals and going through all the different ages and then talking about what parasites they are likely to come across. So welcome to this first episode and today's parasite is Strongyloides westeri. Um, I'd love to actually show you a jar with worms but it doesn't really work like that for this parasite because it's really really small so all we get to look at is some gunk like this. Um, this is actually from the small intestine and you look at the mucosal um, substance that's there in that small intestine and the worms is within that but it's so small that we can't really appreciate it with the naked eye so we can we can look at picture of a worm right here and that's what a female a worm looks like and we can tell that she's a female by uh, identifying those eggs that you see there inside of her uterus so that's pretty clear sign that this is a female worm. So let's first talk a little bit about the naming of these parasites. I often come across a lot of confusion, a lot of lay terms that are fine, but sometimes uh, people aren't really sure which parasite we're talking about. So the Latin name, as I said, is Strongyloides westeri. Um, the common name often used for this parasite is the threadworm. Um, and that's a pretty appropriate designation for the parasite. However, be careful here. There is also another worm in horses that is also sometimes referred to as a threadworm. We call it the neck threadworm. And that's an entirely different parasite uh, that does not have anything to do with the one that we're talking about today. So, you know, I'm a parasitologist, and as parasitologists, we love to talk about parasite life cycles. And this one, actually, in particular. So let's look at a, a graph here, a slide of uh, the, the life cycle. It's, it's really unique. This is number one in terms of uniqueness and fascinating parasite life cycles in the parasites infecting horses. It's, it's a double life cycle. This parasite is the only one uh, routinely infecting horses that has two options. It can choose to be a parasite and infect the horses, but it can also choose not to. So that's why this life cycle chart looks like this. You have that circle there at the bottom, which is the free living uh, cycle of the parasite where it basically can go through all life stages out in the environment it, it, and reproduce, make cute little babies, and keep that cycle going. So this parasite is not dependent on invading, infecting a host, and that's really unique. So it has that option. It can go, well, I don't feel like being a parasite today. I'm just going to ha hang out here in the environment. And then what's additionally unique is that when it decides to become a parasite, first of all, it's only the females that are parasitic. The guys just hang out at home, probably look after the kids, while the girls go on a Viking raid and infect some horses. So that's pretty cool. And then also, it has three different routes of administration that's really unique. Norm normally when we talk about any of these parasites that are infecting horses, it's the fecal oral route, as we call it. So horses out there ingesting grass or eating something that's contaminated with the infective states of the parasite and they get that infection that way. But that's one route of infection for this parasite. It has two additional ones. There's the percutaneous route of infection and that's just the larvae that are just penetrating the skin and getting into the body of the horse that way. And it's not um, something we see with a whole lot of other parasites. It's certainly not in horses. And that can actually cause some skin uh, irritation when that happens. And then most famously, there's the lactogenic route of infection. So that's actually from the mare to the foal through the milk. And I think in this context, it would only be appropriate to give a shout out to Dr. Gene Alliance, a legend in equine parasitologist. I would actually call him a parasitology hero 
the lab that I'm sitting in here used to belong to him. He worked here at the University of Kentucky for 56 years as a scientist, a researcher, and parasitologist. He was the one who described this lactogenic transmission uh, back in the 60s and 70s at a time where that was just unheard of. Worms coming through the milk, nobody really believed that that was even possible. And it took him 10 years of milking mares and looking for those parasite larvae in the milk before he was able to publish this famous paper in 1973. He was the one who discovered it. He's the reason why we know what we know about this parasite today. So that's pretty cool. So what, when do we see this parasite and what age groups? So first of all, this is primarily a foal parasite. And if we look for the eggs of this parasite, um, they kind of look like this. Then um, when do we see foals having these eggs in their, in their fecal samples? So let's look at a graph. So here we have the egg outputs per week of age as the foal go through uh, and get older. So uh, as you notice, it's about up until week 15. Um, so 15 weeks of age, almost four months old, that's when we see foals shedding these eggs. You notice perhaps that it's the week two that is the highest. And there, this, uh, these samples actually get into the thousands of eggs per gram which uh, can look really high, but it's not unusual for this parasite. I, I owe to say that this graph here is from our university research herd um, that again was established by the aforementioned Dr. Lyons. Uh, it's been kept here at the university since 1979 without deworming. So the foals and the horses in this herd do not get any deworming at all. So, so this graph represents what we will see with no treatment at all of any kind. Um, so, um, so it's a foal parasite primarily, and also the graph here really suggests that it's probably uh, primarily that lactogenic route, the one where the parasite is transmitted through the milk, that's the primary one in the foals. Once we get older, beyond four months of age, we can see this parasite sporadically. It sort of pops up a little bit here and a little bit there, um, but it's, it's really not something that we see like across the board, like we tend to maybe see in these younger foals. How many foals gets the, gets the parasite? Well, that's a, that's a big question. Um, again, the beloved Dr. Lyons uh, was the one to really document this, and he documented it through the different decades of his career. Uh, his most recent publications from the, from the 2000s, he, he showed that uh, around here in central Kentucky on Thoroughbred farms, the prevalence in young foals was about 30%. Uh, whether that applies to elsewhere in the world, we can only guess, but uh, it's certainly one, a parasite that's, that's still around, and this is despite uh, our deworming regimens. Um, I should also mention regarding the name um, confusion that we sometimes see, the Latin name for this parasite, it, it's really confusing that it's called strongyloides. It almost so sounds like it's a strongyl parasite. It, it rhymes with it. The, the first syllables of that word is identical, but it's not a strongyl parasite. So just be careful out there. Strongyloides is a very different parasite with a very different biology, as I've already outlined in the life cycle, and has nothing to do with small strongyls or large strongyls. So I just wanted to kind of include that here. So what kinds of disease does this parasite cause? See, that's been a topic of a lot of controversy a um, lot of discussion over the years. Um, when Dr. Lyons got involved back in the 60s wanting to document how it transmitted from the mares to the foals, it was believed that this parasite was the cause of the so-called fo foal heat diarrhea. So the diarrhea we observe in the foals at about eight to 10 days of age when the mares get into the foal heat. Um, it is now clear that that's not the case. There is diarrhea happening around that time in the foals, but that's probably more due to uh, their microflora, their microbiomes establishing, so the, my, the bacteria in the intestinal tract that are populating the intestinal tract, and there's some adjustment to the change of diet. Uh, they start getting a lot of milk, but then they also start feed, uh, eating solids. There's a whole list of different uh, pathogens, bacteria, and viruses that can cause diarrhea. 
and, and those can come into play as well. Um, I want to say that there are uh, veterinary clinics and diagnostic labs have these testing panels for foal diarrhea, and they have a whole array of different things that can cause diarrhea in the foals. And it's just interesting to note that this parasite, Staringylodes westeri, is not on any of those panels. It's all the viruses and all the bacteria that they're testing for. So this parasite is not considered a major cause of diarrhea in foals, uh, although, of course, never rule it out. It can definitely happen, and there is at least one study from the 1990s that demonstrated that with very high egg counts, uh, those foals um, were statistically associated with the uh, episode of diarrhea. So, so there can be a role for this parasite. But in, the, in the larger scheme of things, it's not what veterinarians experience out there uh, in, in their clinics. So how can we treat for this parasite? Again, that's an interesting topic. Um, we know that here in America, ivermectin has been documented to have good efficacy against the parasite and as has oxybenazole. So that's one of the benzaminosoles that's uh, manufactured and sold here in America, but not necessarily in every country in the world. Um, there's no evidence of drug resistance that has not been demonstrated in this parasite, but we should be cautious because that's probably primarily because no one has really looked. It's not something that's studied a whole lot um, I think ethically it can be problematic to do a whole lot of studies because you have to work with very young foals. And so I have not seen any resistance studies uh, recently, but I think clinically uh, veterinarians out uh, there in practice in the real world, their experience, they don't seem to have any issues of resistance for what that's worth. So the big question, the discussion, the controversial topic is should we deworm our mares close to foaling to prevent that lactogenic transmission or not. And that's something that I see a lot of people doing all over the world, farm managers, horse owners, veterinarians aside. Um, I do see that practice quite a bit. I just want to say that there's really no evidence, no scientific evidence that it actually works or does any difference. So we don't really know which drug, which dewormer we should deworm the mare with when relative to foaling we should deworm the mare and what dose regimen we should be treating that mare with to effectively prevent that transmission. Now, we know that those larvae, those strongylodes larvae, are residing somewhere in the mare, somewhere in the tissues of the mare. They're not in the intestinal tract. We just don't know where in the tissues we can guess that maybe maybe the ventral abdominal wall or something like that, something that's close to the udder so they don't have to migrate that long. But um, treating parasites that are, that are hiding out in the tissues in perhaps a dormant stage, that can be very difficult. So we cannot be sure that a single treatment is enough. Dr. Lyons, once again, he really did a lot of great work. He's really been the only one to look into this question. So he published a paper just a couple years ago before his passing where he looked at mares that had been dewormed at foaling and looked at the foals coming out of those mares and, and, and looked at what the prevalence of this parasite was and then compared uh, that to foals out of mares that had not been dewormed at foaling and he found no difference. So does it hurt to deworm the mares at foaling or close to foaling or right after foaling? I don't think it hurts, but I'm also not convinced that it really helps. I don't think we should be deworming a uh, weak old foal or something like that for a parasite that's not really a health-related uh, problem in horses. So that's just my own opinion. So this is really the end of this first video. I hope you found it useful. I will follow up with uh, a next video and the next parasite that the horses are encountering in their life in a similar fashion. So stay tuned uh, on this YouTube channel or this Facebook page, wherever you found this, and there'll be more videos coming. So in wrapping this up, what do I want to leave you with? Well, this is the parasite that sounds like a star jaw, but isn't a star jaw. But it's the one with the coolest life cycle of them all, and it's the one where the girls are going on those Viking raids while the guys are staying home watching the kids. With that, see you next time. Thank you for watching. Bye.